probably continue to join us over the next uh, five to 10 minutes, but I'd like to go ahead and start. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as usual, um, we're very pleased to have you come and join us and help learn about hair. Uh, today, we're gonna focus on hair care in the summer. And there's a lot actually to talk about. At the end, I'm gonna talk about sunscreens, which you'd think would be something simple to discuss, but actually um, it's become a little bit controversial in regards to hair. So we will focus a little bit about that uh, at the end. Um, also, you can see the Q&A uh, icons. Um, if you have questions as I go along, please put them in there and I will address all the questions at the end. Um, I think that's it for logistics. I'm going to make myself disappear, but I will be able, to, you'll be able to hear from me. I'll, I'll keep my, uh, my microphone on. Okay, hair care in the summer. Welcome, as usual. Okay, we're gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna give you a quick anatomy lesson because it's pertinent to why hair gets damaged in the summer. And um, we'll talk about chlorine and swimming pools and what happens there. Uh, then we'll move on to salt water and then to actual sun damage. Um, and then I'm gonna focus a little bit at the very, very end on sunscreens, which is a bit controversial. And um, the information is, is still coming in on that. Um, so uh, we will keep you updated as, as things go on, but I will talk about where things stand as of today. There's me. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Dr. Mary Wendell. Okay, about the hair. Let me just, okay. I just wanna just give you a quick peek at what the anatomy of hair is, which kind of explains why it takes such a beating um, and has a hard time fixing itself. But as you can see, this is mostly under the skin and the bulb is at the bottom, which is where the growth takes place. And you can see that's where the blood vessels are, but that's where they end. Um, once hair is growing, even directly right under the skin, um, there's no blood supply to it. And certainly once it leaves the hair follicle and is external, um, whatever nutrients it gets is, is going to come from, from you and not from internally. So um, again, most of the damage occurs on the outside um, and not in the, at the base, which is where the hair grows. The bulge, the bulge area is where the stem cells are near the opening, but again, there's uh, very little blood supply there. So typically damage can occur at the follicle level, which is at the bottom. Um, the things we do in the summer generally don't affect the follicle. Um, the hair strand um, as it leaves the follicle can be damaged and certainly the scalp can take a beating um, in the summer as well. Okay, again, this just, uh, the message is it's important to remember that once the hair leaves the follicle, it no longer gets further nourishment. There's no blood supply. There's nothing bringing liquid to it. Everything that we do to our hair to style it, whether it's color, straighten, curl, blow dry, whatever, all of this dries the hair. Um, swimming, uh, whether it's pool with chlorine or the ocean with the salt, or being outside in the sun can damage the hair. And it's, it's coming from outside of the hair follicle. Unfortunately, the strand itself has very limited ability to protect itself, very limited ability to heal this damage. And in fact, a lot of what we do breaks down the cuticle, making it more susceptible to this type of damage. Just briefly, we talk about this every time. This is just the normal life cycle of hair. So again, you can see that uh, it grows for a period of years, that's the antigen phase, and then it slowly stops growing, and that's the catagen phase, which is the resting time before it falls out, which is telogen. And then it goes to another resting phase, which isn't listed here. It takes a few months before it starts to grow again. So whatever damage we're doing to it, um, unfortunately causes a lot of breakage, and it can take several months for a new hair, a healthier hair, to take its place. So we need to be very aware of what we're putting our hair through. Uh, and in the summer, this stuff tends to become accelerated because of the effects of swimming and the sun. Okay, swimming pools and chlorine. Um, 
I used to swim a lot um, and my hair was a mess. And uh, at that time in my life, I really didn't know a lot about how to take care of my hair. It was already fine at that point. And it was really my, my uh, hairstylist who, who gave me some very um, helpful hints. Um, chlorinated water actually makes hair more vulnerable to even the summer stresses of, of, of heat and sun and also of salt water. So if you're going in the pool and then you're going in the ocean, it's a double whammy. Chlorine has an oxidizing effect which actually weakens the strands, it removes the natural oils, resulting in dry and damaged hair. It can cause natural colored as well as lightened hair color to turn slightly green because the, the chlorine oxidizes the copper which is normally in the water, particularly if you have hot, hard water, which most of us do in this part of the country, um, the chlorine can change the color and people like to talk about how the hair turned green in the summer, but it's the chlorine that's doing it. Chlorine being a, a harsh chemical, um, if it's repeatedly exposed to chlorine, the scalp of certain people can be very irritated and dry out of certain people that are sensitive like myself. Okay, so what can we do to avoid damage um, from the chlorine? Well, hair actually um, has spaces in it where you can, you can actually protect those areas from the chlorine simply by wetting the hair with clean water before getting into the pool. It creates a barrier of protection. Certainly in a pool, um, if you're gonna be in the pool for a long time um, doing laps, you need to wear a cap. You can put a leave-in conditioner on your hair before putting on the cap. This is what my hairdresser told me. She said it creates a seal and she's right. Um, it prevents water from getting under the cap, but it also prevents the chlorinated water from touching the hair strands. So you can be very generous with that conditioner before you put the, the uh, bathing cap on. Um, you can also apply oil like coconut oil, which is very rich. Uh, oil repels water and prevents the strand from absorbing the chlorine. A lot of leave-in conditioners have oils in it, which do the same effect. All right, what can you do once the, uh, the hair strand is damaged from the chlorine? Most importantly, you need to rinse the hair right out of getting out of the pool. Don't let the chlorine sit on the hair. There are actually, for people who have, who swim a lot and do a lot of laps in, in the pool, there are special shampoos formulated to remove the chlorine. But regardless, uh, even if you're not swimming a lot in pools, when you leave the pool, you should comb it gently with a wide tooth comb after rinsing it. It's important to try to clarify the hair to remove the harsh chemicals. There are special, again, clarifying shampoos for um, chlorine, Aveda, has one, uh, there's something called Trihard, which is specifically for chlorine. Neutrogena has a good clarifying shampoo. Again, if you have hard water in your home, um, sometimes these clarifying shampoos are helpful to remove that. There is a hair treatment in the salon called Malibu, which can remove excess minerals that actually also exist in the hard water, including the chlorine and the copper. Um, you can purchase this online, but I recommend doing it in the salon. Your stylist can do it. Um, it's amazing um, the colors that come out of the hair when they remove some of these harsh chemicals. And again, I can't stress enough, condition, condition, condition. Everything we do to our hair dries it out. Um, this is our keratin deep conditioner, which I use a lot to help put moisture back into my hair. Okay, salt water. Salt water, um, <laughs> we love the ocean. I love the ocean. It feels so healthy. Being in the sun feels so healthy, but salt water actually swells the cuticle, which is that out, outer layer of, of the hair strand, and it makes it look damaged, makes it look more tangled and dry. Whenever you try to run a comb through your hair after getting out of the ocean, you know it just doesn't work. Seawater leaves a layer of saline on the strand and when it dries, the higher concentration of salt crystals on the outside of the hair actually pull further moisture out of the hair strand, making it more fat, fragile and therefore um, more easy, easy to break. Overexposure to salt water can fade or change color. I know this used to happen to me when I was in the salt uh, water a lot by the end of the summer, um, I was, much more blonde than I was at the beginning of the summer, but that's not necessarily a good thing for your hair. 
uh, lighter hair does not protect as well from the, from the salt water and the sun, um, and it tends to be drier. Um, in certain sensitive individuals, salt water can dry out the scalp. Uh, the skin can be very uh, irritated from that. It's interesting that salt water can actually help a few uh, hair problems, particularly dandruff, which often originates from a fungal infection. The salt water actually clears that out, but there are um, other methods of doing that uh, rather than using salt water to um, get rid of your dandruff. We do know that saline or salt water can help heal wounds and sometimes improve psoriasis in some individuals. That is a scalp problem, not a hair problem. You still need to take care of the hair strand, which gets dried out and fragile from the salt water. So again, uh, much like in the pool, you want to do a fresh water rinse before you get into the ocean to soak up the fresh water to block the effects of salt on the strand. Again, consider using a leave-in conditioner even before swimming. There are some pre-swim products available. Some come as sprays you can apply throughout the day. Sometimes just spraying on some fresh water um, helps to keep the salt from affecting the hair. Immediately um, from leaving the beach, uh, rinse and wash your hair immediately after swimming in the, emotion, uh, swimming in the ocean to prevent the buildup of the sodium and the salts. Shampoo and use a good conditioner to add the moisture back immediately. There's a recurrence theme here, um, protecting your hair, getting the moisture back into your hair. Again, treating, um, you want to add more moisture, you want to replace that moisture. Oral treatments like coconut, argan, and sesame seed oil, massage it directly into the hair and the scalp. You can rinse it out after 30 minutes or some, sometimes I leave it in overnight and rinse it out in the morning. It's amazing how much that moisture the hair will then absorb even overnight. Um, deep conditioning treatments, again, leaving overnight is, is helpful. Moisturizing the hair masks. Moisturizing hair masks, which also have a very high oil or fat content can be left in overnight to add more moisture back to the hair. You can use do-it-yourself hair masks with warm, honey and buttermilk, uh, some people use. Um, I personally just purchase a, uh, and utilize our own uh, deep conditioning treatment and hydrating serum to add that moisture back. Okay, let's talk about the sun. Um, I love the sun. I feel healthier in the sun. Um, the winter just takes a beating on my body. I need the vitamin D, I need to uplift my mood. Um, but the sun, there are problems and we need to uh, accept those, appreciate them um, and really protect ourselves from, from the sun. Um, ultraviolet radiation, both UVA and UVB um, is responsible for both the acute and chronic damage, both to skin and hair. We all, those of us that are fair skinned and fair haired, uh, my skin burns just at the thought of going to the beach. Um, the sun causes photo aging, it causes skin cancers. Um, the hair becomes discolored, it becomes dry and brittle, becomes frizzy. Sun damaged hair looks dry, is often unmanageable, and oftentimes won't hold a curl. All types of hair can be damaged by sun, regardless of the color, the texture, or your ethnicity. However, unfortunately, those of us who have fine or thin, thinner hair that's lighter colored, the hair is more vulnerable to sun damage. Uh, unfortunately, that's the, the case in most women that are experiencing hair thinning as well. So we're gonna be more likely to experience hair damage from the sun. Darker, coarser hair is usually oilier and thicker, which can sometimes protect the hair from the sun. The sun's rays actually act like bleach on the hair. Um, it reacts with the melanin pigment in our hair and removes the color in an irreversible chemical reaction. That's why your hair, whether you put anything in it or not, gets lighter the, long, the longer you spend time in the sun. So it, it, it bleaches it out. We love the look, but it's not all that healthy for our hair. It also damages the hair's cuticle, the outer cuticle and the keratin protein layer. Um, using hot flat irons, hot rollers, um, further lightening hair, all make it more vulnerable to the sun. They all damage the keratin, which allows the sun and the heat, as well as the salt and the chlorine that I mentioned before, to penetrate the hair more easily uh, and create more damage and make the hair more fragile. 
Okay, how to prevent and repair sun damaged hair. So again, adding moisture back. Pre or post exposure condition or sprays. Um, Aveda actually has a nice sun care protective, they call it a protective hair veil. Um, I do recommend restorative hair masks either before or after. Again, hair mist sprays, which is just uh, clean water, applying frequently to keep your hair moist as a barrier. Now I've put plus minus SPF sunscreens. Uh, many dermatologists recommend rubbing sunscreen into the scalp as well as spraying on the roots. Um, I don't recommend it and I will explain why later. I do recommend sunscreens for the, for the skin, for the face, but I don't recommend it on the hair and I'll talk about that later. Um, I can't stress enough the benefits of a big hat, <laughs> which provides sun protection for your hair, your scalp and your face. Woven hats are better than straw hats. There are some specialized hats now available that come with what they call UPF, which is ultraviolet protection factor, which is a real thing. I saw a patient this morning. She said, is that a real thing? I said, yes, it's a real thing. So for those of us that are want, want to protect our hair as well as our skin and our face, um, the best thing is a good hat. Um, natural and essential oils do have some sun protection abilities. Um, if you apply it to your damp strands prior to sun exposure, if you don't want to wear a hat, sesame seed oil can smooth the cuticle and can protect the scalp and hair from up to 30% of UV rays. Coconut oil and olive oil can do the same thing. Peppermint, peppermint and tea tree oil have limited SPF ability, but a little bit. Sunflower seed oil contains a lot of fatty acids, which do help in dryness. Again, my recommendation would be to apply a condition spray or oil and cover with a large brimmed hat. Okay, here comes the discussion on sunscreens. Um, you'd think that this would be a simple discussion. Everybody should wear sunscreens and I do think everybody should wear sunscreens, but the question is, are they good for hair? Okay, this is somewhat of a controversial subject. Um, the research is relatively new just in the last few years. Let's just talk about what UV radiation um, does. I talked a little bit about it. Uh, there's two types of UV radiation, UVI, UV, excuse me, UVA, which represents 95% of the UV radiation from the sun. It contributes to photo aging, pigment darkening, and skin cancers. UVB represents 5% of UV radiation. However, it's more biologically active. It's what causes sunburn. It's definitely not my friend. Um, can cause skin inflammation. There are people who actually have allergic reactions to the sun. Uh, I've had that as well when I've been overexposed. It may have some um, issues in terms of causing hyperpigmentation and skin cancers as well. To protect against the sun's damaging rays, you must protect against both UVA and UVB. Oh, that's a typo, forgive me, both UVA and UVB. So um, sun avoidance during peak hours between 11 and two, try and stay out of the sun. Uh, if that's not possible, cover with sun protective clothing, use a big umbrella, big hat, sunscreens. Okay, a little bit of education about different types of sunscreens. There's something called organic, which I think is a misnomer, makes it sounds more healthy, um, but in fact, these to the chemical uh, sunscreens. They literally absorb the UV light. Uh, there's a chemical reaction, it releases a little bit of heat. This is the list of the quote unquote organic or chemical sunscreens. These, these have actually revolutionized sunscreen and created um, huge business. Um, these are chemicals, there is some um, research to suggest there may be some problems with them, but I do recommend using them at this point to protect our skin. I just don't recommend it on the hair. Um, the inorganic ones, which are formerly known as physical sunscreens actually reflect, they do absorb a little bit, but mostly they reflect the UV light. I'm sure you've heard the term titanium and zinc. Um, they protect against both UVA and UVB. They have a lower irritation potential. Um, they don't tend to cause as much um, allergic reactions. When you hear the word broad spectrum sunscreens, this designates protection against both UVA and UVB. And they're usually a combination of products that absorb radiation and convert it to heat as well as reflect it away. 
Many utilize both the organic and inorganic sunscreen in some kind of balance. Okay, the benefits of the sunscreen, we know the benefits, um, particularly with the scalp. Both men and women who have thinning hair are more prone to sunscreen. Um, I've seen so many skin cancers on the scalp of mostly men, but also a few women coming in here because their hair is thinning and doesn't protect the scalp. And the scalp is not very strong in terms of fighting off the effects of UV radiation. So sunscreens can help prevent skin cancers. This is not a small thing. This is a very important, both basal, squamous, as well as the more serious melanoma. Sunscreens help prevent photoaging and pigment changes as well as wrinkles. And this occurs on the scalp as well as the face. So what are the benefits of sunscreen to hair? It can prevent drying and damage, breakage. It can prevent color changes that occur, especially with lighter and tinted hair. So what are my issues? Okay, safety and controversy. Inorganic mineral sunscreens have an excellent safety profile and pretty much are without systemic absorption, meaning they don't end up in your bloodstream. The chemical sunscreens, which again, I don't know how they get away with calling it organic, um, are absorbed into the bloodstream to a limited effect. This has been documented by many studies. Um, these studies do use higher amounts uh, than typically applied, but they did reach a level of concern in the bloodstream. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. I'm just saying you need to be aware of that and be um, careful in reading the, um, the labels of all sunscreens. Chemical sunscreens can cause allergic reactions and can cause irritant contact dermatitis and urticaria, which just means itchiness. Chemical sunscreens may also have some environmental effects and may be able to disrupt an ecological balance. When you go snorkeling anywhere pretty much in the world right now, uh, of course, nobody's gone anywhere recently, but when we do, you probably will find that if you go snorkeling, you are told not to use these chemical sunscreens because there is some evidence that it might be affecting the, um, the ecological balance. So they, they really, like in Hawaii, they have told people to not use them at all. So you're left with using the, the mineral ones, which work well. Um, presently, however, despite these concerns, um, particularly the ecological concerns in the reefs, um, the FDA says there's not enough evidence to change their recommendations regarding chemical sunscreens. And, I, and I, again, I, I don't disagree with that. I just think we need to be aware that there may be problems and um, read labels and educate ourselves. So what's the issue with hair? Um, are they safe using sunscreens around your hair, or in your hair? And the answer to that is they might be safe, but um, there's some evidence to suggest that they might not be safe in hair. So there is a type of alopecia called frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is a scarring alopecia, and it can ca cause permanent hair loss. And you can see in this particular unfortunate patient along the frontal hairline, we're looking at her from the top. She's losing the frontal area of her hair. Um, this type of hair loss was rarely reported before the 1990s. And since then, there has been an explosion of cases of these scarring alopecias, particularly in the last five to 10 years. The fact that it wasn't even noted back in the 1990s, I mean, something has changed, whether it's our environment, whether it's something we're putting on ourselves, in ourselves. Um, it's, it's unclear at this time, but research is, is presently ongoing. Interestingly enough, it's very rarely found in men. So that we have to ask ourselves as women, using more and more chemicals to moisturize our skin, to keep our skin healthy, to keep our hair healthy, um, are we doing something that might be causing this? When we opened up Meditress five years ago, we rarely saw scarring alopecias. We maybe saw one a month now we're seeing two to four a week. It is just exploding. And I think it's important that those of us that are concerned about our hair health should know that there may be some issues there. Okay, in uh, 2016, the British Journal of Dermatology um, published a study that said there may be an association of frontal fibrosing alopecia and scarring alopecias with leave-on facial skincare products and sunscreens. What they found, it wasn't direct proof, but what they found was that in women who had 
frontal fibrosing alopecia, a greater percentage of them use sunscreen. Um, they didn't seem to find a relationship with shampoos, with hair coloring, with birth control pills or hormones, but there seemed to be a correlation or an increased incidence, I will say, with those people who use sunscreens. In terms of other associations with um, the scarring alopecias, there seems to be a higher incidence of thyroid disease, which we know is an autoimmune disorder. So does this raise the possibility that there may be an autoimmune dysfunction with the this type of alopecia? The other thing they found was that the women who had frontal fibrosing alopecia had a higher likelihood of positive, positive allergy skin testing, patch testing, mainly to fragrances. So again, what are we putting on ourselves that might be causing this? Uh, Dr. Uh, Marianne Senna at Mass General, she did allergy patch testing on her frontal fibrosing patients. She tested them for a lot of compounds found in cosmetics, including fragrances and including sunscreens. And what she found was more than 75% of her patients who had frontal fibrosing alopecia had positive tests to cosmetic sunscreens and fragrances. What she found, which was more, even more interesting, was when she had these patients avoid these, these chemicals, their symptoms stabilized and some of them improved. Now, they didn't, it didn't cure them, and that's an important fact to know. Evaluating and removing these irritants didn't cure them but it did improve their symptoms and, and prevented them from getting any worse. Um, the other thing that she found was there that in many uh, patients with this type of scarring alopecia, there seems to be a genetic predisposition. There's a particular gene she found which um, increased the likelihood of that. So not everybody's going to have these type of reactions, which is good. But if you have that gene, then um, you are at risk. Okay. Additional studies, this particular study um, showed that uh, there was a woman who was using one of the inorganic sunscreens called titanium dioxide, um, but there are some, and, and had scarring alopecia, but there are other studies that didn't show a correlation. So again, the answer is not simple. There was a, a journal study in Australia, which um, they study sunscreens a lot because they have more sun than we do. And in 2018, they described a patient who um, had frontal fibrosing, which you can see on the left. And when the, the sunscreens were discontinued on the forehead, she had regrowth. That's an important uh, piece of information. So what do these studies mean? Um, these can be very confusing and the answers aren't in. And presently there's no direct proof that sunscreens can cause damage to hair and cause hair loss. Although again, those studies that showed stopping these items seems to help, uh, does suggest a potential cause. But it is possible that in genetically sensitive people, they could be predisposed to be more likely developing the frontal fibrosing and scarring alopecias, as well as being more likely to develop these skin sensitivities to a wide variety of cosmetic products. I don't know if you've ever read the labels, but I'm baffled by the numbers of chemicals that are in all types of cosmetics, whether it's makeup, whether it's sunscreens, whether it's skin creams, whether it's wrinkle creams. If you read the list of things, I, I just, I shake my head and I say, why do we need all these chemicals? And um, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a specialist in um, developing skin creams, but it just seems like we're being exposed more and more and more every year. So what do I recommend? Um, for now that the answer is not completely in yet and the research is still ongoing, um, but we are seeing so much more of it here. So my recommendations are if you choose a sunscreen and you choose to put it on your hair and scalp to use only zinc oxide or natural oils applied to your scalp and hair strands. When applying sunscreens to your face, which I do myself, I use them and I do recommend them, avoid getting the sunscreens directly to the frontal hairline. I would recommend a zinc only sunscreen or a combination of zinc plus a small amount of the chemical organic sunscreens. This applies to your daily moisturizers that have sunscreens. You need to read those labels very, very carefully. 
And if you think that you're having any irritation from any particular problem, then you can be tested for that. And we're beginning to look into um, doing exactly what Dr. Sana did, which is to test people for irritants that they might be exposed to and see if this could be playing a role. Okay, this is me, what do I do? I uh, wear a very large brimmed hat all the time when I'm in the sun. I burn so easily, I've been doing this forever. Um, but I still recommend it for everybody who's got thinning hair or is concerned about your hair because it's very hard to protect your hair from the sun um, without covering it up. Um, under my hat, I do put oil or a thick conditioning conditioner on my hair because I do go in the water. Um, I do get my hair wet. I immediately come out and put my hat back on. Um, hydrating serum, deep conditioners are what I use. Um, they work great. They protect my hair. Once I'm out of the, out of the water, out, leaving the beach, going back to my room, I immediately rinse my hair out. I shampoo it and I put in a really good conditioner. My hair is very fragile. It's thinning. I, I do a lot to help it, but I know that the salt water, the chlorine, and the sun do dry my hair out. So I am very aggressive at putting that moisture back in. All right, questions. Uh, let me check the screen. There's only one, I think. Um, is salt system pool filtration system, uh, system better than a chlorinated pool filtration system for hair? Um, she finds it less drying for her skin, which is wonderful. It might be a little less drying than chemicals, um, but I still think you need to be careful about trying to wash it out as soon as possible and putting the moisture back into your hair um, when you're done swimming. Let me just look one other place here. Oh, okay. All right, I guess there was some problem with the sound. I guess it got taken care of. I appreciate that. I'm sorry I didn't see that earlier. Okay, somebody asked, uh, interesting question, not related to sunscreens, but are Botox injections in the forehead related to hair loss? There's been no evidence of that. Um, which is gonna make a lot of people really happy. So no, I don't think so. Um, I've not seen anything about that ever anywhere, either in the hair literature or in the Botox literature. So I think these are the only questions. Um, if anybody has any more, I'll hang on for a little while longer. Um, I hope you all enjoy your summer and um, thank goodness it's here and um, we'll enjoy the sun and the salt and just take extra care to keeping your hair moist and get that moisture back in and be very careful with the sunscreens. Keep them away from your hairline. Um, a couple more questions just came in. Um, when using minoxidil on the scalp, can you use a scalp mask over it? Absolutely, I, wouldn't, I would wait a few hours. I would put the minoxidil on and then probably wait um, an hour or so before putting the mask on um, just to give the minoxidil a chance to absorb a little bit more before you put the mask. But I do this actually, I, I use the minoxidil and then I'll wait a little while and I'll put the mask on before I go to bed. Um, somebody asked about uh, the best semi-permanent color or permanent color that we can do at home for people with thinning hair. What I would tell you is um, Honestly, semi-permanent is probably better than permanent hair color and for, for, for all types of hair. And certainly more people are more sensitive than others. And those of us with thinning hair, are, we know our hair is more sensitive. I would avoid ammonia if you can. Um, ammonia is what uh, tends to make some people sensitized. Um, if you get your hair colored and it burns your scalp, it's too harsh for you. Um, so I would use more of an ammonia-free um, rinse or semi-permanent. They're not going to last as long, but they are less, less chemicals to the scalp. Um, can you use zinc oxide sunscreen on your scalp? You can. Um, you can. And I think it's the safest one to use on your scalp. Um, so if you're concerned and you don't want to wear a hat, using a little bit of zinc oxide on your scalp along your part, along the areas that are uh, exposed, um, is certainly better than not using sunscreen on your scalp. I see a lot of skin cancers um, on scalps and the, the, the hair, excuse me, the skin on the scalp is thinner 
um, than the skin on your face. There's not as much fat underneath it. The, the, the tissue is thinner, it's more fragile. And when it gets burned, it gets burned easily. And when the, getting the skin cancers removed is, is oftentimes challenging because the skin is so fragile. So take care. So if you're not putting a hat on, yes, use the zinc oxide on your scalp. Um, somebody said uh, she owns a dog walking business in the sun all day. Um, uh, she's concerned about disappearing hairline. Um, wear a hat, first of all. And secondly, use the zinc, zinc oxide sunscreen, but keep it, even the zinc, try to keep it away from your hairline. The zinc I think is probably safe. There's been no evidence that it um, is an issue. Uh, but again, the research is pretty early on in this particular topic. Um, but put a hat on and put the zinc on your face. Just don't put it right up to the hairline. And I will tell you, even your, your facial moisturizers that don't have sunscreen in them, don't put it right up to your hairline. Um, leave it about a half an inch off of your hairline. We don't know which chemicals could be contributing. Sunscreens are just one of the ones that are being tested, but there are many, many others and fragrances are again, another problem. Does sun affect the PRP treatment? No, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't affect PRP at all. Um, somebody asked, do I have a particular brand of hair color that I recommend? I don't. Um, I just think that you need to, um, to stay away from ammonia. So there's no more questions. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining me today. And um, we're gonna continue with our webinars. Um, people are asking more, more about, oh, another question, more about the um, scarring alopecias. Um, we will keep people informed. I'll probably write blogs to try and people keep people updated on the latest research, which is coming out um, all the time. Um, we will be going to a conference. I probably will be doing it remotely this fall um, for the hair uh, science. And again, we talk about this a lot there. There's, again, there's more research coming out and the people doing the research will be at the conference. So I will keep everybody informed. Somebody asked about heat affecting PRP. No, it doesn't affect the PRP. You don't wanna burn your scalp. Please don't burn your scalp. I, I, it shouldn't affect the PRP, but honestly, you never wanna burn your scalp. So, uh, you know, I'm in a hat. <laughs> I just think, you, you know, if you've got thinning hair and your hair is fine, you need to put a hat on. I just can't stress that enough. Um, and if you can't put a hat on, um, try to uh, stay cool with, with, with uh, freshwater uh, sprays to keep your hair and scalp cool. Um, and if you have to put a sunscreen on, use a zinc oxide one. But heat is not the issue. It's damaging the scalp that's the issue. I've seen women blister their scalps from sunscreen, from sunburns, excuse me. Not from sunscreens, but from sunburns. I've seen blistered scalps from sunburns. So please take care. And you don't know what's happening until you know six hours later when you're home and you and you have the blistering and the peeling and the pain. Um, somebody asked, so I shouldn't put the zinc oxide sunscreen on my forehead, but I should put it on my scalp. Okay, again, if you're going to use sunscreen, I don't care what it is. I would on a daily basis. If you're using sunscreen on a daily basis, I would avoid the frontal hairline. You can put it on your forehead. I would just avoid the frontal hairline. And I don't put sunscreen on my scalp because I wear a hat. But if you're going to use sunscreen, the only one that I would recommend is the zinc oxide. Because again, there's been no evidence thus far to implicate it in these types of problems. So again, I use it on my face. I don't put it on my, my scalp. But if I were to not have a hat, I would definitely put it on my scalp. I wouldn't, it's not something that I would do every day. So again, um, if you're going to the beach once in a while um, and you don't want to wear a hat, then use the zinc oxide. But if you're putting sunscreen on your face on a daily basis, which again, I do to prevent sun damage, I don't put it up to my hairline. I, I hope that clarifies it. I hope I haven't confused things. Okay. Well, again, thank you. Um, enjoy your summer. Um, 
I will keep people updated as things become more, uh, more known and uh, stay safe in the sun. Take care.